Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Gustavo Tolosa. I'm a professional musician, as many of you know. But besides my passion for music, my other passion is the uh, being able to, to regain your health with a whole food, plant-based diet. And uh, many of you um, have already subscribed to my YouTube channel, which is under the name Gustavo Tolosa and my Facebook page, which is Dr. Starch. And uh, I just upload new videos every week. They're free. Uh, you've seen many of the videos we got from Google, Dr. Health, Dr. Lyle, et cetera, and chefs. And today we have a very special guest I've been wanting to have on the show. And her name is Dr. Jennifer Hawk. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about something very interesting, which is The Pleasure Trap, which actually is the name of a book. Maybe she can mention a little bit about that. And then uh, what it is and how do we get out of this? So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Hawk. Um, her, she's an author, a researcher, and an interdisciplinary social scientist who uses the powerful insights of... Um, Steam Dynamics, that's the name of the website, steamdynamics.com, both academically and clinically. And she earned her BA with honors from the University of Washington in Seattle and then completed her Master of Arts and her PhD in political science at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Hawk's graduate work on an ongoing research explore questions at the intersection of social vulnerability, resilience, and well-being. She was born and raised uh, Alaskan, and she now calls Santa Rosa, California her home, where she works as both director of True North Health Foundation and a lecturer and psychology coach who applies the STEAM Dynamics framework to a variety of clinical problems. And um, her clinical interests are wide ranging, but she is especially passionate about helping clients through problems of STEAM processes, romantic misery, addiction and recovery, and mastering the pathways of human motivation. And you can actually get a one-on-one -on -one phone consultation with her if you go to esteemdynamics.com, and I will type that in a minute here in the chat. So thank you, everybody, for being here tonight or today, wherever you are. And <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hawk, for being here uh, with us. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing very well. It's a joy to finally be here after we had to reschedule it. So I'm really happy to to finally be here with you uh, on my little my little patio. So I am um, I've been trying to move for several months, but this is a very difficult time to be trying to relocate. So um, I'm kind of hopscotching around. So I'm at this very cute little Airbnb where I have this nice yeah. outdoor experience. And so until I can move to my new forever home i um i am just kind of wandering the earth with my but with my luggage <laughs> yeah. nice. but this is a big upgrade from where i i've been sort of in hotel rooms because i've right. just been you now in this holding pattern waiting for waiting for a flight it's like a it's like a movie um yes. so yes. i just wanted i wanted to get in a situation where i could be outside so you'll find me outside if there's any option so here i, I am. love being outside so I yeah am and, yeah. and if I recall correctly, you and I had lunch outside once. At yes, Stewart. yes, I, I absolutely. Anybody who's been to True North knows what a great courtyard that is, uh -huh. and it's such a it's such a great spot. I do have one little correction on that bio. The bio must be out of date. I should update. I'm no longer a director of the foundation there, but I do continue to lecture and see patients okay. um, when okay. I'm when I'm in town. So, right. um, but uh, I. That's a good note to me to update my internet to bio. Update that bio, okay. <laughs> yeah. <Very good. laughs> yeah. But you, but you are there, and that's, and that's yeah. Great. Just didn't want anybody to try to send me money for you know a donation right. to the foundation, which you should send money to the foundation, but <laughs> exactly. not to me. Oh. I won't get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so today um, we are going to discuss something that some people know something about this, and for some people is 
quite a mystery when we talk about the pleasure trap and what is it. And of course, everybody, I think, should get a copy of that book written by Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer mm -hmm. and, and read it. Uh, it is a brilliant book. Some, I think it needs a couple of readings because it's dense. It's very dense, yes, very academic. Yeah. But you, yeah. with your wonderful way of putting things, because, <laughs> you know, I love to interview different people on the same talk, topic because mm -hmm. everybody has a different way of saying it. It's like, oh, totally. you, uh, you know, a, a piano, that's what I, and, you know, you can teach the same thing and each teacher will present it and teach it in a different way. So I'm interested in hearing uh, I have interviewed Dr. Goldhammer. I have interviewed Dr. Lyle about this. And now I'm interested in hearing how you put it for us in, uh, in simple terms. And then we could uh, allow people that are logging in here, and thank you everybody for logging in, to actually ask questions. And uh, this is what's fun about these webinars because we can interact. So mm -hmm. the great. basic questions, Dr. Hawk, are uh, what is the pleasure trap? And mm -hmm. number two, uh, and then I'll get out of the screen here. And number two is how do we get out of it? So oh, all it's, yours. It's, <laughs> is that all? That's all people want to know is how to escape the pleasure trap? Well, that's that's no problem. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very happy to talk about this. And it's it's um, it is sort of a different perspective, both because I uh, I know, you know, I work very closely with Dr. Lyle. Those of you who are watching who are familiar with his work, we were collaborators. And so if you go to esteemdynamics.com, you can book a session with either of us and learn about what both of us are up to, see videos by both of us, um, read, read things that we've written. Um, and he and I are co-authoring his next book together. So the the pleasure trap. Um, you know, came out about 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago with um, Dr. Alan Goldhammer. And so that really is, if you are interested in understanding the the ancestral history of, of what really the nitty gritty of the pleasure trap and you, you, you this resonates with you and you really wanna um, get a better grip on all of the, the parts of your brain that are working against you, that book is, is the original source material to really, really understand the problem in depth. But I don't think you need to um, get a PhD in pleasure trap, trap studies to really understand the basic dynamics of what's going on here. And I say that both as somebody who talks about this all the time and works with clients on it, um, but also someone who's really lived pleasure trap realities in a way that Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer have not, you know, they, and that, that's going to get us into a big part of the pleasure trap discussion, which is personality. So we can just like bookmark that because we'll, we'll be coming back to personality a lot if you really want to understand who you are in relation to this, this problem and how it's affecting your success or your, your um, difficulty with success with losing weight and um, developing healthy habits. So um, as somebody who has struggled with the pleasure trap, both with food and with um, alcohol addiction. So anybody who's followed me for any amount of time, I, I talked very openly about the fact that I struggled with alcohol for a long time. I've now been sober for nearly seven years, but you can think of alcohol um, or any drug addiction as sort of a more extreme version of the same exact process that's going on with the pleasure trap with food. It's really just another, the pleasure trap is just a, a sort of flowery term for an addictive process. Um, and it's describing the, the nature of the trap, you were more likely to fall into this addictive process in, in this modern environment we live in because of the nature of the food that is available to us. This is not the nature of the food that we are adapted to as a species at all. It's, it's a completely um, unique experience just really in the last hundred years or so for most of us on planet Earth that we not only have uh, a tremendous abundance of calories available to us, but they're very highly processed calories. They are engineered in an extreme way by the giants of the food industry to be um, extremely palatable uh, and to hit what, what they, they call our bliss point to essentially release a huge amount of pleasure chemicals in the brain. So the pleasure trap, all the pleasure trap is, is it's, it's describing the trap that you are likely to get into where your brain and the, and the structures of your brain that, that were beautifully evolved throughout our, our ancestral evolution to help you make good decisions for your survival and reproduction. All of that circuitry and all of that machinery that you have 
which for generation after generation after generation after generation uh, always was driving you toward finding food, finding really calorie dense food because that was very rare um, and slurping up as much of it as you possibly could in, in one sitting and, and, and occasionally stuffing yourself if you really got into something rich. Um, that was what kept your ancestors alive. If they hadn't had that mechanical instinct to, to go after really rich food and to, to seek it out at um, uh, as a really strong preference to lower calorie density food, they would not have survived to reproduce their genes to become the generation that became the next generation of ancestors and on down the line to you. So if you were on planet Earth right now, there's a very good chance that you have famine proof genes, which means that you lived through a lot of crap. You lived through a lot of starvation. Starvation killed more of our ancestors than anything else. It wasn't saber-toothed tigers. It wasn't um, disease, really. It wasn't old age. It was starvation. That's, that's what really took most of us out. And so the species is adapted just exquisitely to the problem of starvation. And how do you adapt to the problem of starvation? Well, you make very effective use of the calories that are available in your environment, um, particularly if they are scarce. Uh, we just find ourselves in an environment, uh, in the modern environment, which offers us many other benefits, like I'm not knocking the modern environment. It's got a lot of uh, things to recommend it. But this food abundance and the, and the artificial calorie density of the food that's available to us is hijacking these pleasure pathways. So you, you have pleasure chemicals in your brain that are released when you do things that are really good for your survival and or your reproduction. So this is why we call, Dr. Lyle and I call what we do, um, it's, it's evolutionary psychology. We're looking through an evolutionary lens at the kind of animal we are and how we try to solve problems as an animal within a certain constraints of primarily survival, but also reproduction, getting those genes into the next generation. So this is the really, this is the most important thing that we're doing. So you have built-in systems in your brain which tell you whether you're on track or not with whatever you're doing for your survival and reproduction goals. Um, and those are primarily linked to food and sex. So those are the two most relevant things that humans can do to ensure their survival and to ensure their reproduction. You kind of, it turns out you can't reproduce by yourself. Um, and it turns out you can't survive without food. So we we are built to recognize um, and to receive innate pleasure from, from pursuing those things that are going to contribute to, to higher odds of survival and reproduction. And so even you will get pleasure chemicals, you will get dopamine released in your brain if you eat whole natural food. You can eat a carrot stick and you get a nice little jolt of dopamine, but it's a normal amount. It's the amount that you're supposed to receive that's letting you know that was a good choice you made. You 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 did well. That was worth all of the effort that it took to, to go munch on that, go dig it out of the ground and brush off the dirt and chew it up. And it's it's like it's there's some labor involved with chewing that carrot, but there's some calories as a payoff. And so it was overall it was worth it. So good job. We're gonna give you a little nice little shot of good chemicals to reaffirm and to condition that behavior. Um, the the with whole natural food, the more you go up the calorie density scale the more dopamine you get in your brain as a nice little a nice little reward to tell you that was an even better trade for all of the chewing and the effort that it took to get that food out of the environment. So, so people who are attempting to eat healthfully know this intuitively. You, if you've got in your kitchen, you've got carrot sticks and you've got mangoes and you've got roasted chickpeas. Those are all whole plant foods, but you are almost everybody who's listening to this, unless you're like a real fruit fiend, which some people are, um, they're going to go for those roasted chickpeas first, or they're even going to go for a bowl of oatmeal first. They're certainly going to go for something like um, a piece of whole wheat toast and some peanut butter before they're interested in eating the mango. And they're going to be interested in eating the mango before they're interested in eating the carrot stick. And they're going to be interested in the carrot stick before they're interested in the leaf of kale. So this is what calorie density is. It's how many calories per bite of this thing how many calories per pound, how much chewing, how much effort is involved. So your pleasure chemicals are moving in tune up the continuum of the bang for the buck that you're getting with the, with the effort that you're expending to source the food, eat the food, digest the food. This is, there's a lot of labor involved, especially when you're dealing with whole natural food. So this is how the machine works and this is how the reward mechanism is supposed to go. But we have completely interrupted this process by introducing completely unnatural food, this extremely processed food, which completely hijacks those pleasure pathways. So now instead of getting a normal nice little dose of dopamine for eating some chickpeas, you eat a slice of pizza and you're dealing with 
thousands of calories per pound instead of the, the, the natural stone age, stone age equilibrium, which would have topped out at, you know, 800, something like that. Looks like ancestrally, we were eating about 700 calories per pound on average. That included a little bit of meat, that included a little bit of honey, these higher calorie things, but it also included a lot of roughage, a lot of fruit, a lot of tubers. Um, and so you start dialing the calorie density of food up by grinding it into flour, by adding a bunch of oil that doesn't register any satiety mechanisms, by putting a bunch of salt on it, which makes it even tastier, so you want to eat even more of it than you normally would. All of these things contribute to you essentially ingesting more calories than you otherwise would if you were left to your own devices in a, in a whole natural food environment. And so we systematically overeat. And some people, because of their both of their sort of um, physiological genetic profile and also because of their personality, profile, which is also genetic, um, they are more prone to overeat, to fall into this trap, to have trouble getting out of the trap. They have more addictive personalities. Um, all kinds of things begin to interact when you watch people, you, you put humans in front of this very modern problem. It's, it's the fact that we walk around and not everybody is the same amount of overweight. You know, you see some people who are 20 pounds, some people who are 50, some people who are 100, some people who are 400, some people who are not overweight at all. Um, that is the natural variation of the species because more or less everybody's eating the same food. We we get this notion in the in the um this kind of plant-based world that we all spend all of our time in that everybody's you know having big complicated discussions about whether it's it's um it's better to eat your your fruit whole or to grind it up into a smoothie first and are you like is that is it too easily absorbable and all of these we forget that this like this is not even a subject of discussion for the vast majority of people who are wandering around in this modern food environment who are just really uh, eating whatever is available to them and eating a standard American diet, which is a whole notch more ridiculous than anything that people in the, in the whole food plant-based world are eating, even if it's somewhat, somewhat um, processed and calorie dense. So that's basically how it works. And the more you artificially concentrate a pleasure releasing substance, whether it's food or a drug or um, anything that's going to operate in that same way, the more you are walking your way into a potential addictive process that's going to be very difficult to get out of and more difficult for some people to get out of than others for a variety of reasons. All right, thank you very much. I was I was uh, listening here in the background. Yeah. Um, like many people have expressed here, you have a wonderful way of putting uh, this uh, difficult and concept um, in easy to understand terms and thank oh, you that's really Very good nice. so that's what much. i'm hoping to do yes well yeah. You have to be very in smart and brilliant to be able to do that. So, and we all. Uh, you've been listening, you've been listening to those old webinars with Dr. Lyle where he talks how important status is. So you're just giving me status. So yes. it's like, I feel all warm and fuzzy inside. So no, thank no, you. No, it's no, no. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I know what it is like to, to take a difficult concept and being able to, to, you know, bring it and condense it. It, it takes a lot. So thank you. Everybody oh, well, here appreciates I'm that. Really glad um, that it's helpful. So we understand yeah. that, um, I think. And if not, please feel free to put questions here. Um, so how... Uh, how do you get out? What kind of things can we do? <laughs> I mean, to, to, to get out of this, even though it's kind of like going against our nature, right? Yeah, it's absolutely not just going against your nature, but you're going against the strongest instincts that you have as an animal. So, so like we're we're asking, uh, you've got to remember that you you're just a souped up chimp. You're not you're not. This is this is all you really are. I mean, this is sort of the evolutionary uh, lens that we bring to everything is that we have this these animal drives for survival and reproduction, and we're going to pursue them in a really in predictable ways. You know, not just with the pleasure trap and um, and the food environment like we're talking about today. Day, but but everything that Dr. Lyle and I talk about, it, this this extends to the range of human behavior and relationships, um, work issues, all of these things. You can once you sort of put them under the magnifying glass of evolutionary thinking and and the ways in which we're always seeking to sort of 
maximize our uh, the benefit of any particular situation relative to the cost of it. That is sort of the the engine of human decision making and and motivation and how we go through life. So um, that's 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 really what's going on. So the the all, getting out of the pleasure trap requires you to go against the, the, the entire the, the history of the species, which has developed these incredibly strong instincts to seek out the, and, and eat the most calorie dense food in the environment that it can find. And this is not a matter of willpower, folks. This is like, this is not a question of like, oh, well, I'm just really going to grit my teeth and I'm really going to do it. You might be able to grit your teeth and do it for a while, particularly if you have a really unusual degree of motivation, which some people will have, and a really high degree of uh, what we call conscientiousness, which is the personality trait that is probably most relevant to being able to tackle this problem. But the main thing with if you need to get out of the pleasure trap, if you are truly in the pleasure trap and you are you are eating highly processed food and you can't stop, um, you know, I think a lot of people in the in this space uh, will will still consider themselves in the pleasure trap if they eat, uh, you know, a little too much avocado or a little like they're still eating whole natural plant food um, and they're trying to get ever more perfect. So that's we want to make sure that we're not we're not doing too much of that. You want to deal with the. The, the big problems first, which is, you know, are you eating something that came in a plastic bag from the store or something with a long ingredients list, something that has been essentially engineered by a corporation to be extremely exciting to your to your nervous system. Um, so that's that that's the that's the main thing. Um, and we think of this as this is relentless. This never goes away. This never you never just get to sort of get out of the pleasure trap and then that's it. And you never have to think about it again, because these things don't lose their power over you in the sense that you're not ever going, if, if your thing, if your drug of choice is Cinnabon, um, you're never going to walk through an airport food court and not think to yourself, hmm, that Cinnabon, you know, it's, it's, uh, that, it's not the worst idea in the world because you've, you've, you've experienced the super normal pleasure that Cinnabon can give you if, you if you have it. So it's not that it goes away entirely, but you can really dial down the intensity of it. So, um, you know, one good way to understand this is people who have either quit smoking cigarettes or quit drinking. So I quit drinking seven years ago. If I still craved a drink like I did when I first quit drinking for the first week or two, that sort of intense white knuckling craving where you're like constantly having the discussion with your with yourself, with the, the devil and angels on your shoulder, like, oh, just one more time. I can quit tomorrow. It's what's the harm. Like, it's no big deal. If that were a constant presence in my reality, I would never stay sober. Nobody would ever stay sober because that would be so depleting to my willpower over time, which is this finite resource um, that I, I wouldn't be able to hold up to it. You've got barbarians at the gate that are have like trying to beat down the door every day when you're when you're in an active addiction like that. And it's just nobody, even even Alan Goldhammer would not have the wherewithal to, to hold it at bay if he were maintaining just a little bit of the addictive process. So so the key with alcohol is that you get out of the acute withdrawal process and you begin this process of acclimating to whole natural food and the the your taste buds adapt to the the innate pleasure that you're supposed to get from whole natural plant food because you're supposed to get plenty. You're supposed to really enjoy your food as a, as an organism as otherwise you wouldn't be motivated to go and get it and you would die and natural selection would pick you off and your ancestors would not have survived long enough to make you possible. So you have adapted in a context that is amply rewarded by whole natural food. You just don't know it because you've blown out all your pleasure circuits with with bonbons and and pizza and all, all of the other things that people will get into. So if you give yourself a chance, if you get completely out of that super normal food environment for some amount of time, and that's going to vary uh, for individuals. So some people it takes two or three days, some people it might take a week, some people it might be the better part of a month. It's probably not going to be longer than that, even if you're at the real tail end of, of the weirdos at the end of the bell curve who, who take a really long time to, to normalize. Um, and you're going to be most of the way there uh, after three or four days. So if you can abstain from real garbage for the better part of a week, uh, you, you're more than halfway there in terms of your neural adaptation and your, and your, um, the sort of acute withdrawal process being behind you. But if you have a little bit for most people when they, when they're sort of beginning this process and it's like, oh, well, I'll just have one slice of pizza that my husband brings home. Um, or I'll just, you know, I bought some snacks for the kids' lunches. And so I'll just get into that a little bit. You, it's like this drip, this little little drip of addiction. It would be like if I was trying to quit drinking alcohol and I just had half a glass of wine.
wine with dinner. My brain doesn't work that way. My brain has half a glass of wine and it wants the whole bottle. It wants to go out and get more. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with most people when they're dealing with the pleasure trap. Not everybody, obviously. Some people have have a very, um, we all know people. Uh, I know uh, Chef AJ, if people are watching, know Chef AJ her husband is notorious for this, for being able to like, he'll have two bites of cheesecake or vegan cheesecake and be super full. Like, oh, I'm done. Couldn't possibly eat more. So he doesn't have the same sort of whatever's going on with the dopamine signaling and the satiety signaling. He's just a different animal. And so the problem is not the same for him that it is for her and for a lot of other people. So, but you don't, you don't even have a chance at, at really defeating the pleasure trap. If you're in the thick of it and you're really, really struggling with it, you've got to get fully out out of withdrawal. And it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be friendly. Your nervous system is going to throw a giant fit. It's going to go through all the stages with you. It's going to bargain. It's going to scream. It's going to cry. It's going to try to get your sympathy. It's going to try to come up with all kinds of really good excuses about why it doesn't make sense to start yet. And you should start next week. It's going to run through all of the different things that it can do to, to continue to get you to to use the the, the super normal food um, that's in your environment. So that's step number one is is strapping yourself in for the withdrawal process and white knuckling your way out for however long it takes to give yourself a fighting chance at learning at, 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 at sort of literally learning in like teaching your brain that whole natural food is a source of pleasure because if you've been deep in the pleasure trap your brain doesn't know that right now so you've got to you've got to give it a chance um, and that has everything to do with um, what we call controlling your environment so the other thing with the pleasure trap is that unless you have a very very unusually conscientious personality, which most people who find themselves in the pleasure trap to begin with probably don't have like a super mega crazy Alan Goldhammer style 99th percentile conscientious personality. Your only shot, your only chance at beating this long term on, on balance with occasional lapses here and there, which are almost guaranteed, but your, your only shot at long term success is to get your environment clean. You cannot tempt yourself with having stuff around, whether it's your spouse's stuff, whether it's for your kids, whether it's the, the cafeteria at the, the lunchroom at work, wherever you get into trouble with super normal pleasure trap food, you've got to find a way to not put that in front of yourself every day. It's like my dogs. I have two big dogs. And if I if I tried to bargain with them, and even if I really trained them very like really worked with them, I can't leave them alone in a room with a bunch of like open canned food sitting there and expect that they're not going to get into it. They're going to get into it immediately. They're going to get into it the second I walk out of the room. It's actually amazing to watch their sort of calorie calorie density recognition circuits work because if I if I have canned food and dry food in front of those dogs, they will desperately eat all the canned food and ignore the dry food to the point where they finish their own canned food and then they go check the other dog's bowl to see if there's any canned food over in that bowl before they're like, fine, I'll eat the kibble, I'll eat the dry food. Because it's more, it's more chewing, it's fewer calories per bite, it's not as innately rewarding. That's why it doesn't taste as good. That's why things taste good. They taste good because this is like appealing to our innate energy conservation. We're getting really, really good payoff for the effort that we're investing in that process. That those are the signals that we get as far as like what tastes good, what feels good, anything in life that, that we get a positive signal from, it's because we are inferring at the level of our nervous system that we're doing the right thing for survival and reproduction. And if we feel bad, we're getting the signal that we're doing the wrong thing. So all things equal, your feelings are essentially a barometer for your survival and reproduction odds at any given moment um, and that applies across the board but there there it can be it can be tricked and it can be tricked by super normal food which is actually quite detrimental to our health and happiness which is the subtitle of the pleasure trap book but it feels like the right thing to do it feels like you're absolutely making the right choice to to survive and to get those genes into the next generation because it has been the correct thing to do for the entirety of human history it's just in in the modern world in the last century that it's been the wrong thing to do for most of us yes and you know that that to me that is a key point when i talk to people because it's like humans have forgotten that this this present time in the in the whole 
range of, of history. It's just a little brain. Yeah. Oh, tiny, tiny blip in, 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 in an ocean of incredible poverty right. and scarcity. Right. It yeah. seems to me that people think that, that there were supermarkets and refrigerators 2,000 years ago. No, the environment, what you just said, uh, was totally different. No. And it's so no. you mentioned those two things. And so uh, do you think that the calorie density is one of the strong points here to 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 underline to um, get out? Although we know we never really get out, but to to over. Yeah, yeah. Calorie density is is sort of your guiding principle for you know how what how you should be orienting your shopping habits and your particularly if you're trying to lose weight. I mean, there are people who want to get out of the pleasure trap just because they recognize that it's detrimental to their health right. um, and uh, they're not necessarily looking to lose weight. But the, the the thing with calorie density is that you can eat a lot more bulk. You can eat a lot more food for fewer calories. So so a lot of people in this in this space that we talk to, um, you know, AJ, myself, like a lot of people are kind of what we would call volume eaters. They, 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 they like to have a big plate of food, um, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a big difference between a big plate of uh, cheesy nachos and a big plate of kale salad. It's the same amount of bulk, but you're dealing with a whole different reality as far as how many calories are actually in that in that plate at any given time. So the, the idea is you want to be eating a lot of sort of bulky, uh, fibrous, uh, raw veggies, steamed veggies, soups, um, things that are very low in calorie density to, to fill up if you if you need to do that before you eat up the calorie density scale. But that's really getting into kind of the how to hack the system if you if you've kind of gotten yourself out of the pleasure trap. Um, and you're you're looking to kind of lose those last 20 pounds, those last 10 pounds, then we start talking about like, how can we really tighten the screws on calorie density um, and really like bring bring people into uh, a space where they're able to eat a lot more for a lot less calories. Most people who are new to this are, you don't need to tighten the screws that much to see a lot of success. You just need to get out of the really super normal food. You need right. to get out of, out of the food that it has been engineered for your pleasure. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. Thank you. So we have some, we have a few people posting questions. Oh, and, great. Um, let's see. So uh, someone is saying, is there a recommended step by step process for getting out of the pleasure trap that you have seen work well for people? Yeah, I mean, it's really it's uh, you know there's a I spent a lot of time in twelve step when I was getting sober, and so the uh, the the one of the jokes, not jokes in twelve step, is yeah, the only rule is that you don't pick up. So you don't you don't pick up the the alcohol. You just don't drink it. That's the only rule. It's very very easy, um, or as they say, it's very simple, even if it's not easy. So yeah, the biggest step is I I would say getting your environment clean. If you were relying on your willpower to solve this problem, even though you've got a house full of super normal food that you know is a problem for you, uh, you're setting yourself up to fail. Like, I don't care how motivated you are, how conscientious you are, how, how much you think you can do it. Because the thing is that people, um, and I have lived this reality where you, you start off with a lot of motivation. You've, you've gotten yourself all, all geared up. You've read all about it. You, you read your copy of the pleasure trap. You, you, you understand the process. Uh, you're like this time I'm going to do it. Um, and you go buy a bunch of healthy food, but you don't necessarily trash all of the unhealthy food. You keep a couple of things around uh, because a spouse likes them or because you don't want to waste the food or whatever it is. Um, and and so that's problem number one people get into. Problem number two is that they systematically undereat. So they try to they they try to eat too low on the calorie density scale too soon. So you don't want to be um, depriving yourself of, of especially what we call the wet starches, which are the, the, the water rich, hydrated, starchy foods that should be the staple of your diet and the heart of the bulk of the calories that you're getting. So things like oatmeal, things like rice, things like potatoes, things like squash, beans. These things are a little more calorie rich. They're still not, they're, they're not calorie intense, but compared to raw greens, which are about 100 calories a pound, um, you start getting up to something like chickpeas, which are, you know, more like 500 or 600 calories a pound. So you're getting you're getting more, it's it's there's more incentive to eat them, and it's going to actually fill you up more. Um, so people need to be very careful that they they are not depriving themselves and eating a lot of bulk, but systematically eating under the hunger drive, because both that process 
and keeping some junk in the house um, will interact with each other to at some point. I don't know if it'll happen on day four, if it'll happen on day 14, if it'll happen on day 40, but at some point you get out of your groove. You have a bad day or you can't get home at the normal time or Instacart can't deliver the spinach or whatever it is, something takes you out of your groove. And that's enough of a disruption to the cost benefit analysis that you find yourself face down in a jar of almond butter. You're gonna go to something that is incredibly calorie rich because your mind is trying to solve the survival and reproduction problem. And if it is, if it gets sort of confused and it doesn't know what to do in the moment, it's, it's gonna look at its options and be like, uh, the surest thing that I could do to really guarantee my survival and reproduction is to eat something that's a couple thousand a couple thousand calories per pound because that is a guaranteed good choice to make. And if you have that source of 2000 calorie per pound stuff in your house, even if it's up in a cabinet, even if it's hidden away and you don't think that you're ever going to get into it again because you've got this dialed in and you've turned your life around. If it's there, you're you're very likely going to get into it, particularly if you're fairly new in the transitional withdrawal process. Right. Right. Yeah. And, here, and here we get into a, a very difficult, I think, t the situation. Um, so some people know this, some don't, but I, I lost uh, 65, 68 pounds. But I, I came home from a 10 day program and I just wiped out everything from the house. Um, that happens all the time. I talk to so many clients who come fast at True North for, you know, for 10 days and they lose a ton of weight and then they, they get home and it's immediately into the calorie rich food. Totally. So right. the, 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 the recommendation that I always give people is when you like, whether you're just starting off and you're trying to get out of the pleasure trap and you're trying to clean up your diet in general, or if you have done like a 10 day program or a fast at True North or something like that, it doesn't really matter what the circumstances are. You always want to be eating to satiety on a lot of starches, right. like fill your belly up with those starches. They're very satiating, like test after test, like satiety test shows that the single most satiating food for humans is like a boiled potato, boiled right. or steamed potato. Right. It's just, it just really works. Um, and so don't ever, get yourself in a situation where you're thinking that you've overeaten on the wet starches. It's no. really not possible. Um, it's uh, You might eat a lot today. If you give yourself permission to eat as many potatoes as you want today, you're going to go to town on the potatoes, particularly if you've been fasting or, or depriving yourself of calories. Um, and you will actually see the number on the scale will likely go up because you, you, you have a bunch of glycogen in your system and you're going to be retaining more water. So people get like all this kind of superstitious thinking about that. Like, oh, I ate too many potatoes yesterday and I gained three pounds overnight. And that means I can't eat potatoes because I gain weight when I eat potatoes. This is, I mean, my, my colleague and good friend Doug would use a expletive term at this point, but this is just not true. It doesn't work this way. You have more water weight because you've eaten a lot more glucose and you have a lot more glycogen in your system, um, but you have not gained fat from those potatoes. You probably lost fat that day. You just right. don't see it yet. So don't get into superstitious thinking with the scale always eat to satiety on the starches because that is what's going to keep you out of trouble later on when you go to the potluck and there's pizza or there's, um, you know, there's whatever nachos or whatever it is, whatever your drug of choice is. Um, if you've got a belly full of potatoes, you're going to be a lot better armed to combat that. I want to clarify that what I said earlier was that when I came, when I went home, I took everything <laughs> bad out of the covers. Oh, I misunderstood. Oh, well, good for you. That was, that was the right thing because to do. I, yeah. Because I, I believe one of the things Chef AJ says that I, it's funny, but it's so true is if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. It's in your house. It's in your mouth. It's so true. That should be everybody's mantra. And that, that applies to if it's um, within striking distance of your house. So, you know, we, Dr. Lyle tells a story about a client who lived across the street from a 7-Eleven and came, came and said, oh, I, you know, help me develop the willpower to not go to the 7-Eleven at 3 a.m. and get a bunch of ho-hos. And and Dr. Lyle's like, I'm sorry, like it's in your environment. It's effectively in your house because it's 24 hours. It's across the street. The energy expenditure to go over there is so low relative to the potential benefit that you're going to, you're, you're hosed. You're going to go over there. It's, it's like, it's really, it's, you've got to move. Um, yeah. So that's, I've actually had people 
if they're in that kind of situation and they can't move or they don't want to move, you can go, you can bring a photo of yourself to the manager of the store and be like, put me on your do not serve list. You know, like, don't let me in here if you see me. And usually the sort of implied shame of that is enough to keep them out because they don't right. want to run the risk of actually being escorted out. <laughs> well, what, one challenge that people have always, and, and here they're mentioning is, uh, having somebody in the house when like when you're the only one in the house that is trying to switch this way of eating and the rest so it's it's not possible to get everything out of the house that you're not supposed to eat and so that's yeah. a challenge i don't know how to fix it do you do you have any there's no there's no pat easy answer for that it depends on the circumstances it depends on your circumstances and your goals um and it depends on the nature of your relationships and and what what kind of like what are we talking about are we talking about a a husband who refuses to give up his pork rinds because you know he can't live without them or are we talking about some kids who want avocado in their lunch and so you have that around like there's there are degree, a lot of degrees of variation here that people will have different iterations of it but if it's a case where uh, it, it's it's some sort of trigger food where you know that it's a problem for you um, and that you're going to be likely to get into it under circumstances where you're stressed and out of your groove. Um, you either work with the, the cohabitant of your living space to essentially lock it up, you know, like like put it in a like we will do this. We will we will have people like get some sort of um, tub that you can lock and keep your stash of super normal food in there if you've got to have it. Like if that's the dynamic that that relationship has to settle in for everybody to stay happy, then that's what that's the solution that you have to have. The, the thing with this is that there's always a solution. There's always a way to, to figure it out, whether it's locking up the food, whether it's moving to a new house, whether it's um, hiring a chef to come to your house to, to uh, make batch cook every week. There's always a solution to the problem. It's just a, a, your willingness to pay the cost, both the financial cost and the interpersonal cost. Like, are you, are you willing to sort of make yourself um, difficult in your relationships to to really defend yourself against the nature of this trap or not and if there are plenty of good reasons why you might not want to be like if it's really an issue of contention with your spouse and and your like your husband doesn't want to give up his indulgent foods which continue to be a problem for you and you don't want to have that sort of that's just an internal conflict in your desires for your health and your body and yourself and his desires for himself and so that that is what it is. It, it's not going to necessarily, there's no easy, comfortable answer to that. You've got to walk through that conflict and figure out, well, what is the solution that we can come up with, which is probably not going to be ideal for either of us, but it is something that will solve the problem. And, right. and just understand, it's not, it's that, this is, it's not a normal problem. It's not a problem that we've adapted to solve. And so it requires unusual solutions it, mm -hmm. it, for, for certain personalities, for certain biologies. If this is, if this is really a problem for you, you've got to think outside the box. You've got to, you're, you're not supposed to be able to solve this problem. You can't be an alcoholic working in a bar. No. And then we have to throw in another, uh, another, you know, topic here, which is, you know, the different genetics of everyone. Sure. Oh, totally. I mean, I think that as a society, we think uh, that, you know, what works for th that person works for me, but it, it doesn't. So that's another. No, no. Well, in the sense that, you know, the, the sort of the same general diet is going to be optimal for everyone. A whole, a whole plant right, right. food diet is sort of the, oh, the best, best diet for basically everything exactly. for weight loss, for heart disease reversal, for diabetes reversal, for yeah. everything that we would sort of um, be dealing with in terms of our health. But but sure, I mean, personality, this is, and this is something, this is, uh, you know, the world is just now waking up to what's called behavioral genetics, which is this idea that um, so, so much of who it is that we are is really determined by our genes. Um, in fact, there was just, I just saw an article today about, we have researchers looking at genetic markers for uh, higher susceptibility to COVID-19. So, so like if you're, it, like the likelihood of having a really rough course and being placed on a ventilator, they're starting to identify little genetic markers for that. So all, all of these things, like who you are genetically is having this huge effect on both the nature of the struggle, like how uh, how likely are you to put on and keep on weight? Like how, as Dr. Lyle says, you know, how, how sort of thick are your genes? Um, Cause some people, they can eat a lot more food. They can eat a lot sort of uh, junkier food. They don't have the same problem. He's one of them. 
Um, you know, he can have his carrot cake as he's notorious for, and he's not going to gain weight like I would if I were to eat that carrot cake every day. So there's a ton of variation there. Um, but there's also, it's actually up to uh, between 80 and 90% of the variance of whether people are likely to um, become obese or not is genetically determined. We know this from really well-controlled uh, identical twin studies. There have been over 15 million of them replicated again and again, that the, the huge amount of what is determining whether you grow up to be overweight and how overweight you're likely to be, no matter what kind of environment you were raised in, no matter how often your parents took you on hikes, no matter how much wheat germ they, they fed you instead of frosted flakes. Um, it doesn't It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of thing, things when all of that data washes out. It's totally the genes. Um, there's a tiny amount of leverage, obviously, or everybody would there, there, there wouldn't be any way that you could lose weight at all. Um, but it's it's not it's this is mostly a genetic game. So that's happening at the biological and physical level, but it's also happening at the personality level. So your your personality is also profoundly genetically influenced. So how conscientious you are, which is one of the most important personality traits that we look at in what we call the big five. There are big five key personality traits that we look at in um, evolutionary psychology and behavioral genetics. How open you are to new experiences, how conscientious you are, how extroverted you are, how agreeable you are, and how emotionally stable you are. So if I know those five things about you, I really, I have a very good sense of, of who you are as a person and how you're likely to deal with a wide variety of problems. And the greatest predictor of success on, with the getting out of the pleasure trap is how conscientious you are. Um, so you will see like all of the people in this space who have who have lost a lot of weight, who are successful sort of spokespeople for it, AJ, Goldhammer, yourself. Um, these are these are highly conscientious people, unusually conscientious people. So all of these traits, they, they fall on what's called a bell curve, which is you may remember from your PTSD from a stats class that you took in college. It's like a normal curve. It's a distribution of data where most people are right in the middle but you have people at the either tail end, a few at either tail end. So you have a few extreme flakes who are not conscientious at all. Those are the people who just never pay their electrical bill. They forget to feed their cat. They just, they're like out to lunch all the time. And then you have people at the other end of, of the spectrum who are extremely conscientious. Um, and those people, if you're above, like well above average for conscientiousness, this is just easier for you to solve this problem. It just comes more naturally because conscientiousness is how, how much of a rule follower you are, how important it is to you to do the right thing, whatever the right thing may be. So if there's a particular diet that you know is optimal for your health and happiness, if you're more conscientious, you are more likely to be following that diet and to stick to it and to be less likely to deviate all things equal. So if, you, if you're very highly conscientious, you have a much higher degree of being successful over time, but you don't have control over how conscientious you are, contrary to a whole self-help industry that writes books about, you know, all of these different plans to rewire your brain and become sort of like, you know, super habits and all of these different things. There are, of course, ways that you can optimize and work with what you have um, and develop systems to make yourself more effective. But your baseline level of conscientiousness is determined by your genetics. And so if you are very low in conscientiousness, you're going to you're just going to struggle more. It's just freaking unfair. But that's that is the way that it is right it is and uh, oh. a lot of people here are asking when is your own book coming out <laughs> uh, well so I'm finishing the book that, that I'm co-authoring with Dr. Lyle, which is sort of an overview of evolutionary psychology. Uh, both uh, We've been calling it kind of half self-help and half um, textbook. So it's a lot of the history of the field and, and how to think about things, but then we apply it to clinical problems that oh, okay. he's, he's been dealing with, with dec for decades and oh. um, that I work with, with clients on as well. And then after that, um, I also have my book, which will be an adaptation of my, my PhD dissertation, but that's probably, we're looking at, you know, 2023 or so for that one. So, Ooh, yeah. so we're gonna yeah. make it Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Um, I know we have a lot of questions here and maybe uh, we could do uh, in, a, in a while from now, we could do another webinar if you're oh, of course. Curious, you know, very happy to. Yeah, because um, it's just impossible to cram so much. You know, people have questions about personality types. I have done a webinar with Dr. Lyle about personality types. Um, so if you I think, and I, it may be in the in the steamdynamics.com website. I don't know, 
but I uh, think we we definitely have some clips and we're, we're about to have um, if people kind of stay tuned at esteemdynamics.com in the next week or so we're releasing we're actually releasing a, a great amount of video oh, um, and sure. some new, new material that people haven't seen before so stay tuned for that it's not up okay. quite yet um, but maybe by the time people are watching this it'll it'll right. be available but the main um, on YouTube you can find uh, I don't know if he did it as a webinar with you but I know that there's a lecture that Dr. Lyle did called the perfect personality which we yeah. give to people yeah. when they check in at True North to watch um, so he's he's done a few iterations of that talk he gave it at the um the fasting escape with dr nate gershfeld um and uh you know he's talked about it with you and then he's there's there's several different versions of it but yeah. it's talking all about like what would be the perfect what would be the perfect personality to sort of um escape the pleasure trap and he goes through each of the five characteristics and discovers that lo and behold it is a personality type that is identical to ellen goldhammer's <laughs> but, but the takeaway message that people need to understand is that okay so that's the ideal personality for this problem this is a freakish unusual problem it doesn't mean that that's the perfect personality to have for life at all everybody has their own sort of niche picking um your personality whatever it is and whatever the kind of problems with your personality may be because everybody everybody wants to be more conscientious everybody wants to be more open everybody wants to be more extroverted like all of these things um but whoever it is that you are there there is a very you where you do have the perfect personality for that niche so right. the main the core of the advice that we give to people whether it's about diet or whether it's about uh, relationships or work or anything else is you've got to understand who you are and then engineer your environment to fit you don't try to change yourself to fit the environment because if you do that you're you're in a really losing game right. um just like you would be with the pleasure trap you can't change yourself to be to have more willpower with regard to the pleasure trap. You need to get that environment clean. You need to make it as easy for yourself as possible because this is the hardest thing that, that you have to do. You're you're right. fighting against your strongest instincts. Right, right. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm sorry to disappoint anybody here if we haven't answered your question, but I promise you that um, in the future, we'll, we'll schedule another. Yeah, um, absolutely. Please feel free to email me questions. Uh, I'll put the I'll put the email in the screen, but it's bornforhealth at gmail.com and it's born and with a number and then a number four and then health. Um, yeah. anyway, we can do yeah. that. And we have, but still we have learned so so much today and I really appreciate uh, the time that you have given us. Oh no, it's it's a joy to be here, and you know, people can. I have uh, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Lyle and I share one at Esteem Dynamics oh, as well, good. where I post a bunch of a cross post a bunch of stuff. But I do have some things on mine that are only there. So yeah, you, just, you know, put on your little your stocking hat and Google me, and you can find uh, different discussions on all yes, of these things. Yes. And, yeah, um, we'll, and, uh, we'll, okay. Yeah, so we'll put yeah, your name anytime. there and, and and find you. Yeah, well, the, I know the Esteem Dynamics channel is um, just youtube.com slash Esteem Dynamics. I think mine has a more bizarre YouTube URL, but, right. um, but it's very searchable. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you again. And You're uh, so welcome. we look forward to another time in the future. Oh, beautiful. This, it was a pleasure, uh, but not a trap. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining right. us. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye.